growth of a trend. And I kind of wanted to uh, carry on with what Josh has started. And uh, something, something that's, uh, that I got, I talked to my mom about it, something that God has already been dealing with me with, is uh, I wanted to talk about the title is today, You Can Put Truth Over Trend, colon, Already Verified. Already Verified. And that's the title for today's message is Already Verified. So the objective is today is for us to get understanding. The objective for today is for us to get clarity. The objective is to know who God is so that we can know who we are. And also is to, put, to have that push to overcome your excuses and your mistakes and not allow them to hold you back anymore or any longer. I want this message to, to motivate for people to say yes to God and say yes to their purpose. And like I said before, uh, Pastor Joey is a, is a great example. He is a man that said yes to God and said yes to his purpose. And Pastor Joey is an extremely transparent person. He wears his heart on his sleeve. You can take him to the side anytime you want and just ask him, has it been easy being a pastor? <laughs> and he will say, no, it's not easy, but it's possible because God makes it possible. So saying yes to God, saying yes to your purpose is, is risky, it's scary, but saying no is even scarier and it's even more risky because you're risking living a life that you weren't meant to live. So the key verse for today's message is Jeremiah 119. And if you turn to Jeremiah, you can, you can stay there if you want because I, I'm going to stay in Jeremiah for a while. And the key verse is Jeremiah 119. It says, they will fight you, but they will fail, for I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now I'm just going to pray us in before I uh, start the message. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather here, Father God. I pray, Father God, that hearts are open to receive, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you, I, I give you complete access, Father God, to have your way with the sermon today, Father God. I pray that after this sermon, everybody, everybody that's listening, Father God, will have that extra push, Father God, to say yes to you, Father God, and say yes to the purpose. We thank you, Father God, for waking us up and having the opportunity, Father God, to be together. In the name of Jesus, amen. So just going back to the title, Already Verified. So for people who don't know what it means to be verified, verified is a social media term. That's a social media word. Now, Pastor Joey, you're going to be my celebrity today. So to be verified is if I'm on Instagram and I'm going on Instagram and I look at Pastor Joe, what tells me that Pastor Joey is verified, what I'm going to see next to his name is a blue circle with a check mark. Now, to have that, you have to have a certain amount of followers. And on Instagram, uh, I looked it up, you have to have over 10,000 followers to be verified. So if I see that blue check mark, I don't even have to click on his page. All of a sudden, if I see that blue check mark, I'm like, oh, Pastor Joey, he's popular. Pastor Joey's liked. He gets a lot of likes. He gets a lot of views. He gets a lot of engagement. He gets a lot of response on, on every post that he makes. He's popular. But to somebody that's not popular, I can look at Pastor Joey even deeper and say, Pastor Joey is somebody. Pastor Joey is important. Pastor Joey is special. And the difference between me and Pastor Joey, because he's verified and I'm not, that means that a like from Pastor Joey is going to mean way more than a like from me. It means that if Pastor Joey follows you, uh, he might get a screenshot and, and post it on their story and say, Pastor Joey, follow me. But if I follow them, this is going to be another follower. That means that his, his post in the comment section is going to hold a lot of, weight, a, a lot of uh, more weight than my post in the comment section would be. It means that Pastor Joey is, uh, like I said, more popular. And the thing that is, the thing that's wrong with that is that sometimes it can make you feel some type of way about yourself. Let's say that if, if my dream is to be, uh, to be a pastor, and I'm looking at how good that Pastor Joey is doing, it can make me look at myself, what am I doing wrong, what is this? I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a rap artist. I, the, the scary thing about looking at other people and comparing yourselves is because all of a sudden you can make you you can say like what am I doing wrong? How come they don't like me? I, I I believe that my that my music is good. How come they're getting the response that I feel like I deserve? They're not even Christian, and and there's a whole bunch of stuff that can flood your mind. And even outside of social media, it, it can even be a family member. You can you can sit in a group and how come it feels like when this person opens up their mouth, everybody looks and they pay attention to what this person. But when I open my mouth, nobody listens to me. It's not even a social media because if you think about it, comparison and envy and jealousy has been way before Facebook, has been way before Instagram, has been way before Twitter and TikTok. 
it's not a social media issue. The only difference is, is now, uh, you know, back then, if I probably run into Pastor Joey in the store, he could tell me everything that's going on, and then that can make somebody envious before social media. Now you get to see everything. Now I get to see, I get to see the car that Pastor Joey bought. I get to see the house that he lives in. I can see the vacations he's taking, and I'm like, what the heck? Because now you can actually see it now versus running into them in public, and all of a sudden they're just telling you, like, you get to see the, uh, the best life that they're living. And one thing that uh, we have to remember is that God's perspective and the world's perspective are different. The perspective of the world and the perspective of God is totally different. And one thing that we have to remember as Christians is that what's important to the world isn't important to God and vice versa. What's important to God isn't important to the world. And when I wrote that, I thought of me back in eighth grade, ninth grade, I can't remember what grade it is, but I was a kid. And I was amongst my, amongst my peers, and we had free time in class, and the topic was sex. And I remember a kid, they're, they're just talking, and they, and, and they asked me, like, are you a virgin? I said, yeah. One thing about me is that even as a teenager, I, wasn't a, I was bold. I didn't care. I, I'm a Christian. You know what I'm saying? I listened to Christian rap. I was never afraid to invite people to church. I'm the opposite of a lot of, uh, I was the opposite of a lot of teenagers who are scared to say I go to church or I wouldn't come to this event or come to this. Like I was the opposite of that. I wasn't afraid of who I was. And because I held it down and I was solid, a lot of my peers respect me to this day for being true to myself. You know, I'd rather be true to myself than be, to be fake to anybody else. And that's always been uh, key to me as a kid. But the response I get is a typical response. I'm in a public school. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, you know, uh, they can be like, oh, man, you ain't getting no girls. You ain't doing this. You ain't doing that, this, that, and the third. You know what I'm saying? But the thing is, me telling a group of kids in uh, Clark or, or Scott Middle School, I forgot, I forgot what uh, school it was, me telling those kids and me saying it in Juju's uh, youth group, I'll get a totally different response. Juju would be like, you know what, bro, I'm proud of you, man. You're doing good, and, and don't fall into temptation. Like, the response is different. Why? Because of the, the standards of the world. The world don't even have a lot of standards and morals or principles. They're all over the place, and they believe in whatever they want. But as a Christian, we have different standards. We have different morals. We have different principles. And we have to, we have to remember that when we get caught up in these things. And, and I want to talk about the, uh, the word trend. And, and the definition, the definition is, is crazy. It's a, a general direction in which something is developing or changing. Now, going back to truth or trend, you know, truth isn't saying that the trend is a lie. And truth, when we say truth over trend, you know, trend is, is, is not only fashion. It's not only what people are wearing. It could be what people are doing. It can be the, the type of the type of work everybody is pursuing. This is what's getting the most money right now and, and stuff like that. But like I said, truth doesn't mean that trend is a lie because uh, one thing that's really popular right now, it's been popular for a minute, is Air Force Ones, and I'm wearing them now. And the thing is, is you can walk into a party and be like, bro, I, I can be the only person in the church wearing them right now and be like, bro, these are in. And then you can go to a party and see everybody wearing the same shoes. You can't, if, if you say that that isn't the trend, you're just in denial. You know what I'm saying? So the trend is real. The trend is actually something that's, that's going on. It's, it's, it's always going on. Everything is always changing and developing. But the truth part is that we have to go with the flow. of We have to go with the word of God. We can't go with where everybody else is going. You know what I'm saying? That's what the truth over trend is saying, that if everybody's going right, sometimes God is going to tell you to go left, and that's okay, and that should be fine. And that's the issue, and that's what's scary about uh, me being in my 20s. You know what I'm saying? Because because after a teenager, you have a lot a, a lot of big choices and a lot of big responsibilities. The responsibilities keep piling and piling up. And now the choices that I make don't uh, only affect me, but it affects my wife, and it affects our future kids. And so sometimes if they say, you know what, this is getting the most money. I do get tempted. I'm like, you know what? Maybe you should start switching houses and buying them and become landlords. I don't know. Everybody else is doing it. But one thing that I remember too is I remember I went uh, with a friend to uh, the Festival of the Lakes when I was, a, I was a kid, I was a teenager. And when there's, when there's drama, all the kids gravitate to one, to one section, and that's exactly what happened. So me and my friend were just chilling. All the kids wanted to go see this fight. And then my friend was like, let's go see this fight. I'm like, bro, you stupid. We got all these tickets. There's no lines, there's no, lines no more. We can get on as much rides because everybody went this way. Like, yo, let's go get on these rides. That, that was like 30 minutes. 
And that's exactly what happens. Sometimes you see everybody running, and, the, and then you start running, and then God's like, yo, look at all this space over here. Look at all this opportunity that everybody's leaving, and everybody is filling up these spots, and you go see the fight, and you're not even in front row. You're trying to see what's going on, push through, and God is saying, look at all this space that's empty. Look at all this extra opportunity, but you're so focused on where everybody else is going. You're missing a whole side that you can prosper in. And uh, even as me being a Christian artist, you know, um, sometimes I see who's popular. I see the clicks. I see what's going on. And then one day, you know, I'm like, I'm like what if I'm not cool enough? What if my personality isn't out there enough to, to hang out with these guys and so forth? And God is saying, how come you have to be with these guys in order to quote unquote make it? How come you can't just make your own lane? You know what I'm saying? And uh, I don't I don't listen to NF. I don't listen. I, I, I like Toby. Uh, I can't even say his last name. But these are Christian artists that they make their they made their own lane 100 percent. I don't even rock with these dudes, but they made their own lane. Like Lecrae and all them, they have their one side. And then you see Christian artists that, that are not even with Lecrae and his group, but they make, they're making their own impact. They're still hitting millions of views because they weren't afraid to step out and say, you know what, I don't care what's, what, what the cool crowds in Christian rap. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's the same thing. Sometimes you're like, hey, how, come, how come this group ain't listening? Uh, how come this... This group don't want me. How come they're not accepting me? God's like, because I want you to make your own lane. I want you to start something yourself. I don't want you to be a part of something that's already created. I want you to make something for yourself. And even with trends, like I said, it, it gives us a general direction. And if if uh, if I tell if I tell uh, if me and me and Caden likes fashion, if I tell Caden like everybody's getting this. You know, when he go, if I tell him G-Phases, Air Force Ones are in style, when he goes to the store, he's going to see the Air Force Ones, and he'll be like, you know what, maybe I should get that, because I remember me and Danny were talking about these. Maybe I should buy it. What I just did is I gave him a direction so that when he stepped in the store and when he seen that, he thought, maybe I should get it because everybody else is wearing it, and it does look nice. It gives you a direction, and trend is a really uh, – it's really effective, especially because, especially like with young people, especially like when it comes to making decisions, what everybody else is doing, sometimes if everybody's wearing Nike, sometimes it's hard to wear Adidas or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's hard to, to just do, do what you want to do. And the world gives direction, and it also likes to give order to our life. And when I thought about that, I'm like, it's so wild how something so out of order is trying to, trying to give order. Like how something so messy going to tell you how to live your life. And uh, when I got a, when, as I was growing up, I learned that there's, there's a, a process on which your life is quote unquote supposed to go. And after you graduate, you go to college, after you go to college, you get a job, you get a job, you get a house, you get a wife, you get a kid. But, but what happens if your life doesn't go in that order? What happens if it's backwards? What happens if it's random? And uh, I thought about Pastor Sunshine in this sense because she had the marriage, the kids, and the house, and then she went to college. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's extremely hard. And, you know, and, and when, you, when you do things that are quote-unquote out, out of order, it can make you feel like, you know what, you, like you made a mistake. You know what? Like, like you can be in a point like, you know what, I should have went to college, I should have done this when I was this age, and now it's kind of hard because responsibilities pile up. And all of a sudden, you feel like you failed at something. Now, now you, made, you made a huge mistake because you weren't supposed to be. And I took, uh, when I was in college, I took some courses with 30 or 40-year-olds, and I gave them props, like, yo, you're, you're, you're pursuing something. Like, that gave, that gave me, like a, like, a, like, a push, like, motivation, like, yo, that's dope, that, that, that you weren't afraid to come back to school, you weren't afraid to go to school. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes if you see, if you feel like your life isn't going in a certain, a certain order, you can feel some type of way about yourself. You can feel some type of way about your life. You know, I should have been done this when I was, when I was 20. I should have been done this. But what makes us think like that is because of the way that the world try to order our life. It try to give us order. And um, sometimes, you know, uh, I want to read Psalms 37, 23, because this is extremely important. We shouldn't allow the world to tell us the way our life is supposed to go and it's for, uh, Psalms 37, 23 says, the, store, the, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So whenever you feel like your life is out of order, whenever you feel like, you know what, I don't know what step to make first, I feel like I'm too old, or I feel like I'm not smart enough, you have to remind yourself that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord, that God is ordering your steps. So if he's telling you to go to school, if he's telling you to make that next move, we have to remind ourselves that God knows what he's doing, and at the same time, 
you know, just because my life doesn't look like so-and-so's and just because they graduated when they're in their 20s and I'm going to graduate when I'm in my 30s, it doesn't mean that you messed up. It means that your life is different and everybody is supposed to live a different life. Every, God has something different for everybody and that's what makes everybody unique. Everybody having different stories, that's what makes people special and unique. And you know, uh, God is trying to make a testimony out of, out of your life also and we can never, we can never uh, ignore that fact either. So what else is important about social media with trends and everything? And, and like I said before, what's important to the world isn't important to God and vice versa. And what's important to the world is image. Image is extremely important to the world. Who gets the most attention when you walk into the party? The people that look nice. The people that have the best gear on. They get the most attention. What about Instagram? It's all pictures. It's all about image. What about TikTok? Everybody's dancing. It's all about image. And another thing, if somebody posts, I got a, I got a new house, and, they, and somebody else posts a picture, who's going to get more engagement? It's the picture, because it's the image that everybody looks for. And like I said, what's important to the world isn't important to God. And God does care about image. God does want you to take care of yourself. He does want you to look presentable and all that extra stuff. But God is more concerned about, concerned about you, about your heart, about your mental health. You know what I'm saying? God can walk into God can walk into a party full of people. He doesn't see the dude with the Gucci belt or the girl with the Louis purse. He sees the person who has a heart after God. He sees a person that is humble. He sees a person who isn't afraid to be themselves. They see a person that loves God and loves people. And it's kind of like the cliche thing to thing to say. But at the same time, how many knows that they could be a beautiful girl or a handsome guy? whatever, but if their personality is messed up, they're not as beautiful anymore. They're not as handsome anymore. Like, I, like dealing with somebody, like, no matter how good or how, how good a guy or girl looks to anybody, but the fact is, like, you don't want to deal with that personality. You know what I'm saying? And that's one thing, too. God is more concerned about you. God ain't, God ain't concerned about the image. He's concerned, I want to make sure that you're okay. I want to make sure that that trauma that's been holding you back, I want to make sure that the regrets you're dealing with, that we deal with them so you can progress. He's more concerned about what you're dealing with and who you are as a person. You know what I'm saying? And that stuff doesn't matter to the world at all. Everybody, the fake it to the make it is, is 100%, 100% uh, facts. It's facts. You know what I'm saying? Everybody wants to put on a front and make it look like they're doing better than their life actually is. And that's one thing, too, I, I did say in a song, I said, I realized that your, your life ain't as good as your posts, as the stuff that you post. And that's true because I can be so jealous, this person's on vacation, this person's doing this, not knowing that they're going through marital issues, not knowing that they're dealing with depression. And there was a thing that was going on, and everybody said, uh, post a picture of yourself and uh, post a picture that you posted when you're going through the hardest time of your life. And I remember I went to my brother Chodiso's wedding, and I was going through depression. And I got a picture taken of me, and I'm smiling extremely hard. And every time I look at that picture, I'm like, dang, like I was dying inside. Like I was screaming out for help. And I posted this picture because it was my brother Chodiso's wedding, and I love that man to death. And I was happy. I, I'm glad that my depression wasn't, I didn't allow my depression to bring anyone down around me. Uh, one thing about me, please don't give me pity. I'd rather you be proud of me than feel bad for me. That's one thing. Do not feel bad for me. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I'd rather you be proud of me than, uh, than feel bad for me. I don't like pity. I don't like, I don't like to be the one to bring everybody else down, to bring the energy down. You know, if I feel that type of way, I'll just, I'll just stick to myself and be chill. I'm not going to be sad or make everybody else's vibe go down. You know what I'm saying? But I looked at that picture. I'm like, dang, like, I was, I was going through it. And I could look at Pastor Joe, and I could see him with his beautiful family and not even know that he's probably going through a hard time. So you're probably being jealous of somebody who don't even like themselves. You're probably envying somebody who don't even like their lives. You want to be like that person, and that person is not happy where they're at, and they want to be like another person. And this, the domino effects goes. That's why this whole illusion of jealousy and envy, and, and we, we got we to gotta debt that because you don't know what that other person is going through. And what's the, what's the whole purpose of, of, of making you, what's the whole purpose of Instagram and image? You know, uh, what we like to do is we like to post accomplishments. We like to post accolades and milestones. 
We like to post achievements, and basically what it is is we like to post any form of success. We like people to see any form of success. We want, we, we, we like that, you know what I'm saying? And when I say the word success, what's crazy that my mind automatically goes to a dude with a tux. I see him in a really nice car. I see him in, with a mansion. I see him with a lot of money. Success automatically takes me to, to thinking of somebody who's rich. And... Uh, the success definition is the accomplishment of an aim or purpose. The definition doesn't even attach itself to material possessions. It doesn't even attach itself to financial status. It doesn't, it doesn't attach itself to accolades or accomplishments. It's saying that if you accomplish something, you're successful. You know what I'm saying? The thing that's crazy is that my form of success and your form of success can be totally different. You know what I'm saying? It's totally different. And the success, that, the success idea that the world gives us is extremely unhealthy. It's extremely unhealthy. And even when I was, uh, when I was thinking of this, I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about uh, Brother Larry, who, who had passed away. And I see his family, and me and my family always talk about it, like, yo, like, Brother Larry left a legacy. His family's committed, they're serving, and when I think of people who passed away and I think of what they left behind, I, I know for a fact Brother Larry could look back at his life and say, I was successful. You know, I was successful. And uh, the reason why I get that is because he doesn't think, I know for a fact that he's not going to look at how much money he made in his life. He's not going to look at the stuff that he bought. He's going to look at his family and how they're doing after he left. And that's some, that, that, that's that's kind of the legacy that I want to leave, you know? That's what's going to make me feel successful. And his success and a lot of people's success isn't going to come with the money. It isn't going to come with cars. And the thing that is messed up is that if you feel like you don't acquire these things, you feel like you're not successful, and then you're counting out everything that's around you. Automatically, if you, if you make it to your 80 and you say, you know what? I told myself I was going to see a million dollars in my bank account one day, and I didn't. You know, and then you start, start feeling that burden away, like maybe... I wasn't successful, and then you're counting out the people around you that loved you. You're counting out the, many, the people that you ministered to. You're counting out the people that you served and the impact. And I want to let everybody know now that, you know, we can't, we can't live chasing these things. You know what I'm saying? Because if we live a life chasing these things, we're going to just miss out on life in itself. God didn't call us to come to earth and be rich. God didn't call us to come to earth and drive in a Benz. He didn't call us to wear the latest clothes. He called us to live a life that is full and what more than that is being around people you love and investing in people you love. And like I said, success is different to God. Now, we know what the world says about it. If, if I ask anybody in the crowd what a success means to you, you know how you feel about the word success. But one thing that I like to do is I have a study Bible, and I like to read the summary before I read it. And uh, it's important that we know what is success to God. Have we ever asked ourselves what is success to God. What does that even look like? Now, this is a study Bible, so I'm just going to read it to everybody. And it says, what is success? Most definitions include references to achieving goals and acquiring wealth, prestige, favor, and power. Successful people enjoy the good life, being financially and emotionally secure, being surrounded by admirers, and enjoying the fruits of their labors. They are leaders, opinion makers, and trendsetters. Their example is emulated. Their accomplishments are noticed. They know who they are and where they are going, and they stride confidently to meet their goals. Now, just reading that, everybody can agree that's exactly what success sounds like. That's exactly the definition the world gave me growing up, that that's what success is. Now, I'm going to keep on reading. By these standards, Jeremiah was a miserable failure. And we're talking about Jeremiah. For 40 years, he served as God's spokesman, to Judah, but when Jeremiah spoke, nobody listened. Consistently and passionately, he urged them to act, but nobody moved. And he certainly did not attain material success. He was poor and underwent severe deprivation to deliver his prophecies. He was thrown into prison and into a cistern, and he was taken to Egypt against his will. He was rejected by his neighbors, his family, his family, the false priests and prophets, friends, Friends, his audience, and the kings. Throughout his life, Jeremiah stood alone declaring God's messages of doom, announcing the new covenant, 
and weeping over the fate of his beloved country, in the eyes of the world, Jeremiah was not a success. And everybody can agree Jeremiah does not sound successful. If I ask you, would you rather be Jeremiah or Will Smith, I don't think anybody would pick Jeremiah's life over Will Smith's. Now I'm going to keep on reading. But in God's eyes, Jeremiah was one of the most successful people in all of history. And this is what I'm talking about, what the world, what's important to the world isn't important to God and vice versa. God's perspective and the world's perspective are different, and we have to believe that for our own lives as well. Success as measured by God involves obedience and faithfulness. Regardless of opposition and personal cause, Jeremiah courageously and faithfully proclaimed the word of God. He was obedient to his calling. Jeremiah's book, and then it talks about Jeremiah's book. But the thing is, what's extremely crazy and what blows my mind is that you can be put in a room with a celebrity who has millions of dollars, and God would you, God will call you the successful one. God would say you're successful, and God, you can be like God. He's the one who made, who, who impacted the world. He's the CEO of Google. He's the CEO of Amazon, and God's like, no, but I'm proud of you. I'm proud of what you're doing. And this is exactly what I want us to do today is I want us to start counting. I want us to stop counting ourselves out. I want us to stop looking at our lives and comparing it and feel like we're not, we're not important or we can't make it a certain impact. Now, I'm going to start reading in uh, Jeremiah. We can start Jeremiah 1, and I'm going to read 4, 4 through 6. And this is Jeremiah talking. He said, the Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your uh, mother's womb. And before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. This is Jeremiah speaking. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you for I'm too young. And this is the part that got me. I can't speak for you for I'm too young. Jeremiah, what I put here is how many times have we excused ourselves? We removed ourselves, we rejected ourselves, and we counted ourselves out because we think we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not good looking enough. We don't have the money for that. You never graduated, so on and so forth. Everybody has, everybody has had, currently has an excuse why God can't use them. Jeremiah's, that's the first thing he told God is, you can't use me, I'm too young. That's what his response was. His response wasn't, God, you're calling me out of everybody. You're calling me. God, what do I do next? He said, I'm too young. And that's exactly why a lot of people aren't walking in their purpose right now in their lives. That's the reason why nobody's made up. That's the reason why people aren't seeing the fruits. That's the reason why people aren't excelling is because their excuses are holding them back from saying yes to God, which means you're saying no to your purpose. So we can definitely relate to Jeremiah. I'm too young. You know, even when they ask me, when they ask me to preach, I still get nervous to this day. But I'm like, what if God has something for me in this area and I keep saying no and pushing it aside? Why? Because I'm not smart enough. Why? Because I don't know. One thing about me is I always felt like I suck at explaining stories. I can I can be somewhere, something crazy could happen, I could go home and I could be telling my wife and I'm explaining it like I really suck at this. Like, I'm not explaining myself good at all. And then for them to ask me to preach, and I'm supposed to explain the Bible, I can't even explain the drama to my wife that happened at work that was two hours ago. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, dang, I really suck at explaining myself. But that was, that, that's, that's not a reason for me, or a good enough reason for me to say no to God or say no to pastors when they want to challenge me to step into my purpose. And I just want us to all know that we can relate to people in the Bible. You know, a lot of us can see ourselves in that moment saying, I'm too young. A lot of people can say, I don't have money for that. I'm not smart enough. And we can keep on reading to Jeremiah uh, 1, and I'm going to read 7 through 9. It says, the Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And do not be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and I will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the one I really want us to focus on. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Look, I have put my words in your mouth. What, in verse, what was it? In verse 5, what did God tell Jeremiah I wanted to do? He said, I wanted to be the prophet of the nations. What does a prophet have to do? They have to speak. What did God do? He blessed Jeremiah's mouth with his words. You know what that means? 
Before God called him, Jeremiah didn't have what he needed to, 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 to be successful in, in his purpose. But when God called him out, he provided. He provided Jeremiah what he needed to be successful. That means that if God is calling you to do something, you can say, I don't have it. I, I, I might not have it, but that's when God provides. We see right here, Jeremiah didn't have God's word in his mouth because how can God give him something that he already had? God called him, and then after he called him, then he provided. So what if you don't have the money? What if you, do you, what if you don't have what it takes? That doesn't mean that God's not going to give you what it takes. That doesn't mean that God's going to provide and make a way possible for you. All you got to do is say yes and find out. And one thing about me is I'm more afraid of saying no to God than saying yes. I'm more afraid... People are scared of taking a risk. I'm scared of missing an opportunity. It's totally different. I don't want to, and we were talking about fear the other day, and I heard somebody say, I'm, I'm scared of the future. For me, I feel like the future gives me hope. I'm scared to be 40, to be 50, to be 60, and look back at my life and say I could have done more. To look back at my life and say I should be somewhere different. That's what scares me. That's what keeps me up at night. You know what I'm saying? And... We have to believe that when God calls you out, that God is going to make going to make everything possible. Like if you pass a joy is somebody who's walking in his purpose, take him to the side and ask him, did you think it was possible? No. Pastor Joey can say, I didn't have the church didn't have money for this. I didn't have money for this, but God did it. Like, look at the stage. Look at every look at the renovation after covid. Everybody was going through it. And we we we, we leveled up big time. You know what I'm saying? In a time where it didn't even make no sense, God provided. Why? Because Pastor Joey said yes. Why? Because Northgate said yes. And when we say yes to God and we say yes to the purpose, we don't care what it looks like, that's when God starts to get busy. Now let's go to Jeremiah 1, and I'm going to read 17 through 19. And this is what's going to uh, go into the, uh, the key verse for the message. Jeremiah 1, verse 17 through 19. It says, get up and prepare for action. Go out and tell them everything I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them or I will make you look foolish in front of them. For see, today I have made you strong like a fortified city that cannot be captured like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole land, the king's officials, priests, and the people of Judah. The key verse, they will fight you, but they will fail. For I am with you and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, you might be afraid to walk in your purpose, but what a completely changed everything is a purpose, the person you're walking into your purpose with. What kind of confidence will you have knowing that God is with you, knowing that God will take care of you, knowing that God got your back? And the thing that I always remind myself is David. And I think about the courage that he had when he stepped in Goliath. The first thing he said is, I come in the name of the Lord, which means that he didn't focus on the giant in front of him. He focused on the God that was in front of him. He knew who he was facing Goliath with. That changed his whole perspective. So anybody that's scared to walk into their purpose, anybody who's scared to say yes to God, the thing is, is we have to remind ourselves who we're walking in there with. Anytime I had an interview, I told myself, God, I'm walking in here with you. I will not be afraid. I will not be discouraged. I will talk with confidence. I will walk with confidence. And it changes your whole perspective. It changes your whole perspective. And one thing I thought about, too, is that Northgate is my family. I'm, I'm cool coming here. I can walk into this church by myself, and I'm confident. I'm chill, you know. But if you tell me to go to a different church by myself, a whole different story, a whole different story. What I might do is I might stand by the door and wait for a whole group to come and walk with them. I might stay at the door for a while and look around, and where do I sit? I'm kind of nervous. I don't know nobody here. But the confidence changes because I know who I'm with, and I know who's around me, and I feel comfortable <laughs> And when you go to an unfamiliar place, of course you're going to be scared. Of course you're going to be uncomfortable. Of course you're not going to know what's happening. But when you walk in there with God, it's going to change. It's going to change your whole perspective. It's going to change your attitude, the way that you carry yourself, the way that you respond. I'm just going to close this up. So, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of time, so I just want to give him the 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 big stuff out the way. So Jeremiah seen himself young. What God seen was a man that he can use to spread the message. 
you might see yourself a certain way, but God is seeing yourself a whole nother way. And the reason why you can't see yourself the way that God is seeing you is because you don't know God in that area yet in your life. And when you get to know God, you get to know how he feels about you and how he feels about you is going to change your confidence. Now all of a sudden the fears are out the window, the insecurities are out the window because God said I can do it. God said I can do this. And I remember I was watching, uh, me and my wife, we love The Simpsons. And we're watching, this, uh, we're watching the episode and, and Lisa was doing something and uh, it was a whole bunch of guys and they're going, they're, they're, saying, they're saying, fall, Lisa, fall, you're going to fail. And Bart is, is with the cool kids. And then all of a sudden, he sees his sister struggling. He says, you know what? This, that's my sister. He said, Lisa, you can do it. You can do it. And everybody's like, why are you chatting around? That gave her enough, enough energy to, to finish what she had to do. And that's exactly how it is. Whenever you're struggling, whenever you're failing, just remember the person who's cheering you on. Remember who's saying you can do it. Remember when you're fasting and you want to give up, God is saying you can do it one more day. You can do it one more week. You can put that phone down. You can put that cheeseburger to the side. You can do it. And this all happens when you know who's on your side. If you don't know who's on your side, of course it's going to be hard. Whenever somebody's, whenever you see a boxer, take his coach out the side. Take, take his whole team out. When he sits down, have nobody to spray the water in his face. Have nobody to pat him up, to tell him what he's doing wrong. Of course it's going to be harder for him. But once you know who's on your team and who's on your side, it's going to change the whole reason. So the answer to the reason why you can't say yes is because you don't know God the way that you should. The reason why is because you don't know who's on your side. And that's something I want to challenge everybody to do. And going back to uh, the social media topic already verified, one thing I want to throw out there is that having a lot of followers doesn't make you a leader. It doesn't make you a leader. You're just an influencer. Having a lot of followers, you know what I'm saying, where are you leading them to? You know what I'm saying? So somebody who has a lot of followers, you could, you could be a leader regardless of the fact. And the beautiful thing about God is that sometimes you have to prove your worth to people. Sometimes people feel like one thing that, uh, that annoys me is that sometimes people come up to me like, yeah, bro, I know, I know this person knows this person. And yeah, bro, I've been getting this amount of money. Like, why do you feel the urge to tell me how good you're doing? I feel like you're talking out of the insecurities. The loudest person in the room, the loudest person in the room is usually the brokest. And that's extremely facts. Like, I don't have to tell so-and-so I'm doing this, I'm doing that to prove to you that I'm important, to prove to you that I got something going on. And the, thing, the beautiful thing is you don't have to prove. One thing you don't have to do is prove to God your worth. You don't have to prove to God how special you are. You don't have to work the way you have to work for other people, the way you have to prove to a boss, I can hold this manager position. You don't have to prove nothing to God. So just like the title, you're already verified. To prove to other people that I'm dead, to prove to other Christian artists that I am actually becoming more successful, they're, the first thing they're going to do is look at the views. The first thing they're going to do is look at the engagement. They're going to look at the numbers. But that's totally different, God. The, fir- the, thing that, the first thing is that I'm doing Christian rap, and that's it. I'm not doing Christian. I'm not doing rap to glorify myself. I'm not doing rap to glory. And that's the thing that God looks at, and I have to remind myself, you know, like God isn't, isn't impressed God isn't impressed by numbers. He's impressed. He, he, he's just proud of the fact that I'm doing it for him. You know what I'm saying? And once we get the revelation of what God thinks about us, the response from other people and the feedback on social media or people around you, the negative vibes won't determine how you feel about yourself anymore. It, it, because we know how God feels about us. And if you don't know how God feels about you, I'm going to read you these two scriptures to get you started. Jeremiah 20, uh, 9, 11, it says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a, and a hope. And also Isaiah 41, 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And what that tells me is that there's somebody out there that cares about me. There's somebody out there that wants the best for me. So if God is calling you to do something, it says right here, his thoughts are not of evil. It's telling, he's telling you to do something because he knows what's on the other side. And like I said, we can go with the trends. I, could, I can pursue a certain job because everybody's pursuing it. And God is telling me to do something else because he knows that that isn't going to last long. And he knows that soon the thing that I'm telling you to do is going to start becoming the new trend and you already are, are ahead of the game. You know what I'm saying? 
So we have to know who's on our side. How does God feel about us? And, and, how, and that is going to determine the decisions you make, and that's going to determine the attitude that you have when you make those decisions because you're going to walk in confidence after you, after you find out how God feels about you. So just remember, you're already verified. You're already, even if you feel like you're not qualified, there's a reason why God called you. God doesn't make mistakes. He didn't make mistake, a mistake when he called Jeremiah. Because, he made, because Jeremiah said, yes, he's in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? So what kind of history or what kind of impact you can you make if you said yes? If we look at people in the Bible that was insecure, we look at Moses, he had a stuttering problem. Noah was a drunk. There was prostitutes that made it in the Bible. And God is saying, I use people out of the ordinary to make a statement to bring glory to my name. And I want to do the same thing with your life. I want to do the same thing, exact same thing when your life, so that when it's your time to go, the impact is, it, it keeps going and going. Look at Pastor Joe again, his kids. You know, you see Juju playing the piano, Josh is leading, Letho leads. You know, even when Pastor, Pastor's gone, he's going to know that, you know what, my kids are going to carry on what I already started. And he's going to look at that like I, I you know, uh, that's his form of success. And I know that is because I know his heart. So I just want to encourage everybody, uh, stay yes to God. And remember that saying yes to God is saying yes to your purpose. Don't allow your excuses to be bigger than God. Don't allow your fears to be bigger than God. Or don't allow your insecurity to have more weight than uh, God's uh, presence. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for uh, your time. Thank you for having me. And God bless everybody. I love you.